And you are watching PBS Books. Hi, I'm Fred Nahat. Nice to have you uh, along with us for our series of uh, virtual engagements and partnership uh, with PBS, with the Library of Congress, and uh, with libraries and librarians uh, nationwide. Uh, this is all part of a virtual uh, event, an exciting partnership around the Library of Congress National Book Festival. This year, it is virtual. And so we're uh, bringing you a series of events uh, across the country with our uh, partners, all leading up to a September 27th, uh, two-hour documentary that airs nationwide on PBS. Check your local listings uh, for that wherever you are. Uh, and the online event, uh, the National Book Festival from the Library of Congress celebrates its 20th year uh, virtually. And you can uh, go throughout September 25th and 27th at the website for the Library of Congress, which is uh, loc.gov. Uh, so those are the particulars. Uh, We're certainly uh, excited to have you along uh, with us. Uh, the festival itself uh, and, uh, and the broadcast uh, has a number of acclaimed American authors, uh, which you would come to expect uh, from Library of Congress and the great work uh, that uh, they do. Uh, it has hosted uh, the national special by Hoda Kotb. We're very excited about that, the host of uh, the Today Show uh, on NBC and uh, a library uh, uh, fan and I guess self-described uh, geek. Uh, so that's all coming together. And then the online virtual festival itself uh, with notable authors, uh, including Joy Harjo, Salman Rushdie, uh, Madeline Albright, uh, John Grisham, and so many, so many others. Now, this is our first in a series of virtual uh, engagements. We're excited uh, that we have some talented uh, folks to talk with us uh, today, and we're going to dive into those conversations with uh, with our uh, featured uh, author uh, on this uh, engagement live stream on PBS Books. Uh, this is an exciting one for all of us. It is um, uh, Kali Fajardo Anstein will uh, join us in just a moment or so, the national uh, book finalist. So we're excited about that for a uh, uh, collection of stories. Uh, but first, we are partnering, uh, as I mentioned, with public television stations, PBS stations, and libraries across the country uh, on this event. It is nationally available, but also particular to our friends uh, in Kansas City and uh, Kansas City PBS uh, and the Kansas City Public Library. Uh, speaking of which, I'd like to welcome in uh, now John Heron, who is the new director of the Kansas City Public Library to help me get this uh, whole thing going. John, thanks for being here with us on PBS Books. It's exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Well, it, libraries is an essential institution and also I like to say an inspiring uh, institution. These are extraordinary times and so no different from uh, uh, folks and friends at the library, including in Kansas City. Tell us about what's happening um, inside the Kansas City Public Library uh, these days as you take over and continue to serve your constituency there. Well, again, thank you once again, Fred, and uh, and welcome everyone. Just very quickly, um, KCPT, Kansas City PBS affiliate, has been a terrific library partner over the years, and we are very honored to be working with PBS Books this evening, and of course, very proud to be part of the Library of Congress National Book Festival. In many ways, this is a is a natural collaboration for the Kansas City Public Library. We take a lot of pride in helping to redefine the role of public libraries in America, in large part through our award-winning public programming. We have hosted top authors, um, important public figures, ranging from Stephen Breyer and Sandra Day O'Connor to Condoleezza Rice and the fabulous cast of Queer Eye. We offer cultural presentations, we stage town hall forums on civic issues, and we help foster dialogue on contemporary social concerns such as racial equity and public health. So in all of our extended spaces, you're going to see COVID testing and blood drives, food services, voter registration efforts. They're all part of our, of our regular activities. We are especially proud here in Kansas City of our leadership in the effort to close the digital divide in our region. Also for things like our innovative children and youth program, um, our extensive community outreach, particularly to our many disadvantaged patrons. The pandemic has put community needs in stark relief, and we are very happy to be part of that corrective. So I arrived at the library in July, uh, just about two months ago, 
taking over after the previous director, Crosby Kemper, accepted a presidential appointment to head the Federal Institute of Museum and Library Services. So it's a challenging time to be sure. I'm not so uh, confident that I would encourage anyone to do a career pivot during the middle of the pandemic, but this is also an invigorating time for all of us in the library. So my background is in American history. I spent more than two decades um, in higher education. The last several years as a professor and then administrator here at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. And so I think with that, I am perhaps more appreciative than most of the effort of the Library of Congress to examine kind of the important historical role um, that, that uh, some of these efforts play in our country. And among other efforts, or excuse me, among other areas, I would suppose, I specialized as a historian, I guess I still do to some extent, in the American West, um, which pulls me all the more into Kali's presentation tonight. So it is an honor for me and it's certainly an honor for the Kansas City Public Library to play a very small part in, in, in bringing her to you tonight. Demonstrating, of course, uh, the essential nature of these institutions, including the public library uh, and uh, public media serving uh, folks free to everyone, uh, wherever you may uh, reside. Let me follow up uh, John, on the Library of, of Congress. It is at once uh, a confluence of history and activity that reaches uh, libraries across the country, drawing back to this 20th annual festival where the, the theme is American ingenuity. How large does the Library of Congress loom for folks like you who across the country are serving folks uh, every day through your public library? Well, I think there's no question that the, the library um, and li libraries you know, broadly defined are, this is, may sound kind of odd coming from a person directing a library, but libraries aren't really in the book business. Mm -hmm. Libraries are in the community business. Um, and so figuring out ways to, to help the community, to build community, to strengthen community bonds, this is what libraries do from whether it's your very small town rural library to your big massive urban public library systems, they all are trying to figure out ways in which they can enhance, elevate, and improve community relations in their neighborhoods. So it's a very local, yet at the same time, a larger national initiative um, to help participate in a, in a very public conversation about what is social good. And that strikes me as being uh, certainly in alignment with the theme of uh, the National uh, Virtual Book Festival this year from the Library of Congress, American uh, Ingenuity, and those things that you describe are ways we keep trying to advance and move our institutions forward to serve in better and broader ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree. I, I think, um, I mean, that the idea of American ingenuity, um, I think is a good one to, to, to host the, 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 the symposium, the theme, the conference. Um, I think in the, in the public mind, uh, ingenuity is often linked to invention, right? That unique dynamic that is American know-how. And as a result, ingenuity has defined much of American identity. And again, this is an occupational hazard as a historian, but I, I suppose since the colonial era, bootstrapping inventors have been especially significant to the success of the American experience, to, to building you know, American community. So whether we're talking about deep historical figures like Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Edison, or closer to our own time, Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, um, inventors have become significant cultural figures, even celebrities um, that are congratulated for their ability to solve problems and overcome challenges and, and push society forward. And there's certainly much in this story and their contributions that are remarkable. In the space of a single century, the United States, again, thanks to American ingenuity, went from a disconnected rural agricultural economy to an urban industrial giant. Again, a, a world power. That is no small feat. But I also think that we can maybe take this theme and consider American ingenuity in a broader sense that would enable us to expand our cast of characters. Because to use just one example, the success of this effort took the labor of literally millions of immigrant laborers to power the industrializing machine. And there are many overlooked figures 
Margaret Knight, George Washington Carver, uh, Catherine Blodgett, Victor Ochoa, just to name a few, whose ingenuity also impacted American society, and yet they probably remain unknown to many of our, uh, of our listeners this evening. So just as Kali, uh, our guest this evening, takes the very traditional narrative of the American West, which I guess at least in the pioneer mythology is the province of, of, of white men, she adds the experiences of Latina and indigenous women to create a, a more complicated yet undeniably sort of broader and richer understanding of the region. If we can take a kind of a more complete view of American ingenuity, it can illustrate just how important our, our collective resourcefulness is to understanding what makes America so unique, what, what is so key to our national development. Well, we appreciate uh, uh, those words. Uh, Going to leave it there. I want to say thank you to John Heron, who is the director of the Kansas City Public Library. And John, of course, this note, uh, the Library of Congress, a virtual book fair, the 25th through the 27th this month, but also that two-hour documentary on PBS will air in Kansas City, on Kansas City PBS, uh, on October 4th at 1.30. John Heron, director of Public Library in Kansas City, thanks so much for joining us on PBS Books. Thank you, Fred. Well, continuing along our series of engagements surrounding this uh, it's quite an essential American event. It is the Library of Congress Book Fair virtually this year, the 25th through the 27th uh, at their website, Library of Congress, uh, loc.gov. Also the two hour documentary coming on uh, PBS, which is a highlight of the magnificent and incredibly talented authors uh, that are lined up that you've come to expect there uh, in the physical uh, event uh, and certainly uh, in this uh, virtual version for 2020. We are pleased and proud to be uh, a part of that at PBS Books. Well, now it's time to introduce uh, our featured guests. It is, um, well, she is incredibly talented. The latest uh, collection of books uh, is, well, making quite an impact on those who are picking it up uh, and reading it, and including those who are looking at literature these days and saying, boy, this is top level stuff. This is uh, uh, award winning uh, type of stuff. It is, Kali Ferrardo uh, Anstein, uh, the collection of 11 short stories titled Sabrina and Karina, focuses on the lives of Latinos and indigenous descent from Colorado and Northern New Mexico. Uh, as I mentioned, Kali is a National Book Award finalist, uh, and it is our pleasure, Kali, to have you here on PBS Books. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Brad. I'm so excited to be here. Well, it is, we're thrilled to be able to add new voices to the American uh, dialogue and picking up on uh, what John Heron uh, was saying, that traditional mythology, that hegemony about uh, westward uh, movement and white men and colonialists and uh, manifest destiny is leavened, now is uh, accented and certainly rich in the fabric those indigenous and Latina, certainly women in your construct who have given so much to the American story, that's sort of where you zero in. That is something you're familiar with, but also as an author, you celebrate. Yeah, definitely. So my family has been in Colorado as long as the records go back. And in Northern New Mexico, some of my family members lived on the Pueblos. Um, I'm also a very mixed person. So I have Filipino and Anglo white um, ancestry as well. So I, I really think of my life and the people that I come from as being part of a convergence of different migration patterns and of people who came out of the American West who were indigenous to this, this land and this zone. Um, and when I was studying literature in college and in high school, I did not see any representation of women like those in my own family, like those in my own community. And so it really felt like the space of American literature was something that I adored and I wanted to be part of so desperately, but I didn't know if I would be welcome there. So it is, it's, really, um, it's really such an honor to be able to tell these stories and to now have reached such a wide audience. And I hope through my work, um, our understanding of the American West is widened. And for those of us who always knew what it was like, and for those of us who are from here, I hope that we feel a little bit more seen in that way. 
Uh, Kali, Ferrado, Einstein, stay right there. We are continuing along with this uh, virtual engagement event all surrounding the Library of Congress National Book Festival, September 25th through the 27th. And the two-hour PBS documentary hosted by Hoda Kotb uh, is coming up on September 27th, but check your local listings for your uh, PBS station in your market. Let us take a look at the clip of the two-hour documentary, uh, Kali, and we'll talk about it on the other side. Hey everybody, welcome to the 20th Library of Congress National Book Festival. Hello, I'm Salman Rushdie. My name is Joy Harjo. I'm the 23rd U.S. Poet Laureate. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Reynolds. I am the current National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. I'm extraordinarily excited to welcome Jenna Bush here to the National Book Festival. My name is Haben Gurma. I'm a disability rights advocate and author. Welcome everyone, we're here with Madeleine Albright, the 64th Secretary of State. My name is Amy Tan, and I'm a novelist. I am Ann Patchett, and I am here with my friend Kate D. Camillo. Hi, I'm Sandra Cisneros. Hi, I'm John Grisham, here with the uh, National Book Festival. Books make us better human beings, better able to relate to one another, to think things through, and to take us to a better future. The theme of this festival is American ingenuity. And what exactly would you say, Colson, ingenuity is to you? Given what I've worked on for the last like six years, those two books, I would say it's uh, survival. People who never have to struggle or never have to work, they don't really have a lot of reasons to innovate or to fight their way out of something. That's the only thing we can count on in life is that there will be problems, that there will be pain. We have these enormous capabilities, and yet here we are, sleepwalking, unable to awaken and to create the future that we need to create. What literature has always done is to give readers new ways of framing the world. And I think you can't function in the world today if you don't understand the history. History has to be spoken about as conversation because Ultimately, that's what it is. The great possibility of America is that we affirmatively decided that reason would be a guiding principle. You have to be free. Free is including as many imaginations as possible. Often, our best examples of creativity live in the in-between spaces. But it's the coping that's where the story is. I mean, the, the coping is the joy, and the joy is the journey. This year, in 2020, when we are in need for inspiration and a way for American ingenuity to lead us forward, these creative minds surely do remind us why the importance of memory, the need for reason, and the key to imagination are all rooted in words we find on the page. And that is a bit of the two-hour documentary that you will see September 27th uh, nationally on PBS, but check your local listings celebrating American ingenuity. Certainly we are uh, so thrilled and proud to partner uh, with uh, the Library of Congress, uh, uh, Carla Hayden, uh, Maria Rana, who you saw there in that uh, clip and, and all of our friends there. Hi, Fred Nahat from PBS Books, joined once again uh, by Kali Fajardo, uh, Anstein, and you, uh, Kali, are among uh, this new collection of voices that we add uh, to this uh, tapestry. Uh, and as we think and talk about uh, uh, your latest collection of stories, I guess it strikes me that uh, we talked a little bit about how you derive information from the or inspiration from the characters that uh, that you create. Are there authors uh, that you have read maybe from childhood on through to today that in turn inspire you? Yeah, definitely. I'm, I like to say that I am a writer because I was a reader first. So I found books pretty early on as a child, and they were really a safe haven for me. Um, they allowed me to feel secure, and I could take them anywhere I wanted with me in my backpack. 
and I could always enter back into the world of the story no matter what was going on around me. Um, some of the first, the, some of the first works that really um, captured my imagination, um, the Little House books um, by Laurie Ingalls Wilder, those were really important to me being a Coloradan and hearing about the landscape and the prairie. Um, and I just thought it was so neat that this girl, this girl grew up and became a woman and she wrote all of these books. Um, along with that, I got really interested in um, a lot of YA fiction when I was younger. The Giver was really important to me, Z for Zachariah. But it wasn't until I got to college and I became a Chicana and Chicano studies minor, and I was introduced to works by Gloria Ampaldua and Sandra Cisneros, Julia Alvarez's work, that I really was inspired to become an author because I felt like it was possible. After I saw other Latina women and their works were being published all over the world, I thought, I can do that too. Um, but so many inspire me. And that, that I guess that leads me to uh, an author's life and the idea of being a part of the Library of Congress National Book Festival in its uh, 20th year in slightly a different form this year. Uh, but we're certainly glad to be able to provide. What does that mean as an author to be a part of such a prestigious event? It's I mean, it's just it's such an honor and so heartwarming. Um, I wanted to be a librarian. I wanted to be an archivist um, in, a, in a previous life. And I didn't know that being an author would ever work out. And so one of my first internships was in records management in Washington, D.C. at the National Institutes of Health. And one of the highlights of my entire internship was a visit to the Library of Congress. And I just thought this is the most sacred place on the planet. I, I can't wait to come here someday as an author. And so this is just such a huge honor. Honor. And the, you know the uh, the whole um, uh, white glove uh, treatment, and 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 they take that very, of course, ser uh, seriously. But I guess record keeping's uh, losses uh, is our gain. So uh, Sabrina and Karina, this collection of stories, as an author uh, and, and a novelist, it's one thing to take on uh, the arc of a single work. What are the, what are the different aspects of putting to, uh, together a collection of short stories? Yeah, it, it was it was a long time coming. So I think that was one of the aspects that was a little bit different. Now that I'm working on a novel, I kind of have the understanding what it feels like to work on a continuous project for a number of years and just one project. Yeah. With these stories, I started them when I was in my very early 20s. Some of them actually started when I was a late teenager. I was going to Metropolitan State University of Denver. Um, and so I think it takes being able to reflect on who you are as an individual, what your worldview is, and being able to understand how you shift and how you change over time, but that there are certain things about the way you perceive the world that are just an essence part of you and do not change. Um, and I really learned a lot about myself in the process of writing Sabrina and Karina. And through that, uh... Uh, authorship through those uh, writings, what you learned about yourself, uh, if you can give us some exposition, um, what are you telling us about yourself through uh, these stories? I think the number one thing I'm telling readers through these stories is that I am resilient and you are resilient too. A lot of my characters um, are dealing with very serious issues, substance abuse. Um, I'm thinking of Sabrina and Sabrina and Karina, who who was murdered at the start of the story. Um, I'm thinking of Cole and Tony. She was um, in prison and she's only recently been released. She was an alcoholic. Um, she was a thief. A lot of my characters have committed great crimes in the past and they're learning to heal themselves but also heal their communities as the stories go on. Um, and so I want people to know that yes, you are resilient, my characters are resilient, we can all be resilient. Talking uh, to Kali Ferrardo uh, Anstein, who is uh, the author of Sabrina and Karina, all part of the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I should also mention, uh, folks, if you're watching us, uh, you can contribute questions and we'll ask uh, uh, Kali those questions as uh, we go through. Sticking on the theme of uh, character development, I guess the challenge uh, for uh, any writer, uh, and certainly in this collection, is to develop characters who are at once metaphorical, but also human. And so when you think about process, do you, in your process, do you create the ethereal about that character and then give them human qualities or do you do it in reverse? It always changes depending on the project that I'm working on. But with some of these characters, the voice essentially just starts coming through me. Um, I'm thinking of Tommy, that the story I just mentioned, 
I was driving from Laramie, Wyoming, and this great snowstorm started coming down on the highway. And I had to pull over my little Grand Prix that I had at the time. And I was really scared and I was shaking at the wheel, waiting for the snowstorm to sort of clear up. And as I was sitting there waiting, this voice started to talk through me and it was Cole, Tony's auntie. And she and, to she and Tony had this long conversation and they helped me get back on the road. So sometimes it's really sort of a miraculous process like that. Well, and part of it is what the author does for the reader is give those human characterizations through uh, providing that uh, backstory. And I guess we're all living through uh, our backstory now in these critical times. It is the uh, singular event of the last 100 years, I guess, that may include or test or even provide some metal for us as characters. What are your thoughts on this as a writer as we go through uh, this crisis together of COVID-19 and so many other difficulties uh, we are having in society? How do we derive inspiration out of this and, and turn this into a silver lining? That is a very good question. And it was something in the early days of the pandemic, I had no idea how to answer that. But now I think I have a little bit more of an idea. Um, I've been noticing a lot about downtown Denver. This is where I live, I walk around. And one of the things I'm noticing again and again is how strong we are as people, but also how much we have care and empathy for one another. So I'm seeing a lot of just community support and people, being there for one another when you wouldn't think that that would always be happening. And so I think we can really look to the positives right now and see how we're functioning as a people, as a family, as this extended large family of, of community. Well, sticking on the theme of, of, of Denver, you mentioned it earlier, uh, that is where you reside. Denver, like any American city, it has, um, Denver to me, it seems like, it. it on, on the one hand, it's it's rugged, it, it's it's demanding. On the other, it's soulful uh, and settling. Is it, it does location give you some more inspiration, or does it make you tougher, or both? <laughs> That's a that is a great question. Uh, Denver and I have a really unique relationship. I think I I don't think I would be a writer in the same way that I am without my city. I I'm a writer who's very much inspired by place. Um, a lot of the, the physical locations in Sabrina and Karina, I'm thinking of the house in Remedies, um, the house in Galapago. Those are actual homes in my family. They were homes of my elders, of my great grandmother, my great aunties. Um, so I do believe that I'm somebody who's very embedded in the land that I come from. And I, I think it's made me um, a strong person, but it's also made me a person who is very open to outsiders, and is very accepting of different cultures because Denver to me is a convergence of people coming from all different places and coming together and creating this unique city. And in some in some ways, I guess it's a responsibility that you uh, you accept as as a writer uh, to represent those uh, people, to represent that uh, piece of diversity that maybe hasn't uh, been showcased uh, as much. And I think of Latina. Uh, I think of uh, Indigenous. And those are the kinds of things I, th I think is we're getting more forceful around recognizing those contributions. Uh, but the whole theme of, uh, of American uh, ingenuity back in the days before there were any state lines or, or national uh, borders, uh, there were people here in this country on this landmass doing things that were, uh, well, full of ingenuity. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Somebody once said that my, my ancestors predate statehood. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting because I don't even think of time in that way of that this land um, became something else when it became Colorado. Because to me, when I look at the land, I really look at it as a living, breathing thing. Um, I think at the beginning of Sugar Babies, the very opening of the book, I described the landscape of, as looking like um, a blonde in the day and a raven-haired beauty at night. To me, the landscape is very alive and it's taken a lot for people to live here over the centuries, over thousands of years. And that is part of the fabric of who we are. Talking to Kali Fajardo, uh, Ann Steen, who is part of the National uh, Book Festival, virtually presented uh, this year by the Library of Congress, uh, September 25th through 27th. Check it out at uh, libraryofcongress.gov. Uh, and the PBS uh, 
two hour documentary that's coming up. We're also thrilled at PBS Books to be a part of that. Uh, certainly, uh, Kyle, you've probably seen the lineup for this year's book festival. Who, who are your favorites among the notables there? I'm really excited to see um, Colson Whitehead. I really love Nickel Boys, so I'm excited to see what he has to say. And um, I, I think I'm just I'm just curious to see what it's going to be like. Amy Tan, I was a huge fan of the Joy Luck Club when I was younger. Sandra Cisneros, I'm such a big fan. Joy Harjo, um, I could go on and on, but I am ecstatic to see the special when it comes out. Yeah, we're certainly uh, excited uh, for it as well. Talking to uh, Kali Fajardo of Anstein, and this is this collection of, uh, of of stories is your current work. Certainly recognized, uh, people are taking to it. Uh, is, is there something that you're working on now? You mentioned you mentioned a novel. Give us a little bit of a precursor to that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm working on a novel that is set between 1890 and 1933 in Southern Colorado and in Denver. It has to do with my family's migration from the southern portion of the state into the city in the, during the Depression. So it's a love story. It takes a look at racial injustice, and it also takes a look at working as a woman during that time period. And I've done extensive research, and I'm I'm in the editing stages right now, and I'm just so excited to be able to deliver a novel to my readers, not just short stories, but a larger work. Well, of course, uh, back on the, the short stories uh, are so many things are derivative of a short story. Uh, you know, a film works, uh, serialized uh, pieces, and so it's a, I guess maybe it's a good way to uh, get started. Looking for questions uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, one is, what would you tell young people about uh, a path uh, as a writer and what's the best way to get started? I'd say to anyone who wants to be a writer, the best way to get started is to read voraciously. Read across genres. Don't limit yourself to the particular kinds of works that you normally like. Um, and once you start reading a lot, you'll start noticing certain things about craft that you really enjoy. So I would keep sort of like a reader's notebook by your bed. And that way you can start marking down like, oh, I love how this author does characterization. I love how this author builds worlds. And I think through reading, you will find your pathway to being a writer. And it's, uh, speaking of uh, uh, building those uh, worlds and being, I guess, um, relentless about archiving and outlining and, and going for your goal. You also, I think you mentioned earlier, have to be open to uh, your inner voice and those things that are speaking to you that may be unexplained, which is a source, I guess, of uh, for so many writers, so much inspiration under the, uh, the heading of, it just came to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think once you start to practice viewing the world through a lens of inspiration, you will start to notice it every day, everywhere. I mean, it's gone to the point where I see symbols, literary symbols, while I'm walking down the street, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how do I put that into a story? And so it's not that I don't have ideas, it's that I have, in some cases, too many ideas. And I think that that's something that you can build up and you can strengthen. Um, and it all comes down to creativity and working with that muscle. And at the same time, you look you look around and speaking of deriving traits uh, from your own family and those people in your circle uh, of influences, uh, how does your, again, uh, family and your personal experience relate back to these characters we meet uh, in Sabrina and Karina? I'm a writer who definitely pulls from my lived experiences. I'm very open about that. My characters are sometimes even a composite of people that I've known in my real life and that I'm pulling together different pieces of them. I'm thinking of the short story Sisters in the book set in the 1950s, and it's actually based on an ancestor of mine who faced an unspeakable crime. Um, and these are stories that I lived with my entire life, and I'm always sort of hunting for them, but the ones that I choose to work with are the stories that really haunt me and essentially keep me up at night. And, 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 and when you experience that, uh, is that sort of when you know you you have something? Yeah, you start to feel like the fizzle, the vibrations. You're like, I gotta get to a computer. I gotta start writing immediately. And I always sort of worry that'll dry up. But I think the more that you listen to it and the more that you respond to it and you show up to work. And when I say that, I mean, you actually sit down, you carve out an hour for yourself or more. Most days, 
you will write something and you will see, oh, I am inspired. Things are coming to me. And what is the what is the push point? Assuming that uh, as, as a writer, uh, you have got off to a, uh, a start uh, uh, to a written work or a piece and it just sort of fizzled. How do you know when you break through that wall from from the idea into that arc of creativity that that you know there's no turning back? I think I think for a short story writing in particular, it's important that you write a draft to completion. So you have a full draft that you're working with. Um, and then another important component of this is it's it's really hard to judge your own work right away. So I would suggest having someone close to you, my little sister Piper, she reads everything I write, she always has since she was a little girl, and she's honest with me. She'll tell me this doesn't quite make sense, I think you need to push a little bit more. But I think it's important to also develop a readership among your, your family and your friends and have that kind of feedback. Well, I think our, our viewers are, are uh, tuning into this uh, line of thought, someone uh, checking in with us, asking us about, uh, as a writer, uh, what is your management of right brain versus uh, left brain? How to keep the thing on the rails, but also make it worth keeping on the rails, I guess. That is, <laughs> that's a really good question. I mean, obviously, as an artist, I... I'm very much of one mode of thought, which is I like to do what I want. I like to be a free spirit, but at the same time, you really have to get work done. Um, and some of the ways that I have balanced my right brain versus my left brain is I've made sure that I hit word quotas. And so that keeps me on track. If I'm trying to write a draft of the novel and I'm writing a thousand words a day, to me, that's an organizational tactic. And that's not something that's just following the whims of my creativity. Um, so I think developing goals for yourself, small and large goals can really help with that. And so that's on the tactical, maybe the strategic side, but on, on the visionary side, how do you how do you create that ongoing space uh, mentally, emotionally, artistically to keep that story frame alive when word quotas or organizations or outlines are certainly the order of the day? One of the ways that I keep my creativity alive when I have a long project that is taking a lot of energy is I will give myself sort of little rests and during those rests I will go research. So let's say I get to a chapter and they're going to a dance hall and I'm getting a little bit bored, or I'm getting a little bit tired because I've been writing for days and days. Um, I will stop and I will drive to the location that I'm thinking I'm setting my story in and I'll walk around and I'll look at it. So I think refreshing your your sort of artistic creative bank, that helps a lot too. Well, yeah, and, and the, the which puts me in the mind of, uh, you know, uh, Tom Wolfe. He, he could do a half page or a whole page on a, on, a, on a burled staircase. And and it made sort of the story and the trappings of that story uh, come alive and, and breathe new life into it. And you were speaking of your free spiritedness uh, in this time of, of COVID and everything else. Uh, has there been a, a governor placed on your free spiritedness or have you been able to transcend uh, through thoughts and ideas uh, to get to some higher place? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been challenging because I write in libraries. My preferred place to write are the private rooms that you can check out at the library. I mean, it always has been. And I think that's a product of coming from a family of seven children. So I never had my own space to write growing up. So that was really hard to adjust to in the beginning. But something that I have found that I have not experienced since I was a teenager is that I'm writing as a means of escape. I'm writing these scenes that are set in bars or you know massive parties, concerts, all these things where people are together. And I'm entertaining myself while I'm working, but I'm also feeling that sense of community again. So I think the imagination is really powerful in these times. Talking to Kali Fajardo Anstein, and uh, she is the author of Sabrina Karina collection of uh, 11 short stories, all a part of the Library of Congress National Book Festival coming up this month, September 25th at, uh, through the 27th at Library of Congress website, uh, loc.gov. Um, we do have some questions uh, coming in, I guess kind of back on that, uh, that last topic. Where is your favorite place, a viewer asks, that you have gone for a research project? I have I have so many I have so many favorite places because I'm really um you know how there are method actors I really consider myself sort of a method writer mm -hmm. um, but one of my favorite places I just published a, st a short story recently in O magazine online called The Yellow Ranch 
And I actually visited that ranch that it's named after in Southern Colorado last summer. And I stayed there alone for two weeks. And if you were to read the story, you'll see um, my imagination really got away with me while I was down there. But it, I mean, there's something about being in that, that ancestral homeland where so many of my ancestors came from. It just felt so rich for inspiration. Well, you mentioned you're one of seven. Where are you in that order? I am the second oldest. So I was always a big sister and sometimes a little sister. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got it. And, 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 you know, I'm no expert, but there is something to uh, the order uh, of siblings and creating that own sort of uh, mini uh, governmental uh, body that allows us even more exposition. I mean, our parents are on uh, on one level, but some of the best and greatest imaginative play, which I have to think uh, plays into someone's writing in, in, in later life, comes out of that interplay between siblings. Uh, talk about that. Yeah, definitely. So my family is pretty interesting. Um, out of the seven children, six of us are girls. One is a boy. There are two sets of twins. And our big sister was sort of always the, the little mom. She was always keeping us in line. And I was sort of like the vice president, but I was a little bit more wild. And I, was, I think I was a little bit meaner uh, to some of my younger siblings because I like to be alone so much. Um, and when I, when I say I like to be alone, essentially what I mean is I liked reading. I liked reading by myself and other places. Um, and so we have really rich, interesting dynamics with each other. Some, some of the siblings are closer and they're in smaller groups. Um, sometimes we get together in a larger group. Um, a lot of jokes are flying, a lot of storytelling. And now many of my siblings have their own children. So the family just keeps growing and growing and they, they inspire everything I do creatively. Oh, is, isn't it also true that as uh, as we have these stories uh, of that happen in families uh, in real time, part of that process is the retelling of those stories. And boy, by the time a couple of years go by, we got the narrative down uh, perfect. Myth making within families and presentation within families uh, is a key to telling a uh, telling a compelling story. Yeah, that you know, it makes me think of the story Sabrina and Karina from the collection. Uh, one of the lines is Sabrina is asking Karina, do you remember what your first memory is in the entire world? And it ends up being a memory that they share. So they're not sure who actually like owns the memory. They're not sure who the event happened to. And so I think that happens a lot in families where we're told something so many times that it becomes part of our own memories and our own consciousness. And I can even recall family stories from ancestors who died before I was born, but I feel like I know them. I feel like I can see them. And sometimes they're there in the room with me essentially while I'm working on my, my stories. And part of, uh, part of that introspection on behalf of uh, your character related to you, do you remember your first memory? I do, I do. So when my um, my little brother and sister were born, they're twins, they, I was almost three years old. And I remember going to the hospital and that old TV show, Dinosaurs, that was on in the little playroom. And I remember pushing a pink stroller and telling my older sister, I can't wait for the babies. I can't wait for the babies. I thought I could put them both in my little stroller. <laughs> Talking to uh, uh, Kali Fajardo, Anstein, this is uh, all a part of the Library of Congress uh, Virtual National Book Fair, which is this month, uh, January or September, pardon me, September 25th through the 27th at loc.gov. Uh, and the two-hour documentary uh, on PBS uh, that premieres September 27th, but is airing uh, across the country in uh, different times. So check your uh, check your local listings. Uh, we have uh, uh, another person asking about uh, young people uh, and uh, your advice. What is that mix between how much time you spend reading and how much time you spend practicing or writing for real? I think in the beginning, for me at least, um, it was mostly reading. I was reading so much. I mean, I was just consuming. I actually had a contest with a classmate of mine um, in third grade, and we would race through books together. Um, and so in the beginning, I think it was maybe 90% reading and 10% writing. But now I've gone to a space where it's still probably around 70% reading and 30% writing. Um, but I would say do what works for you. Maybe read a little bit, and if you feel inspired, put down the book and see how long you feel like you can write for that day. And Kali, what are you uh, currently reading? 
I just read Everything Inside by Edwidge Dantaka, and it's just phenomenal. It's so beautiful. And it prompted me to go back to one of her earlier collections, Crick Crack, and start reading that. Um, the first story, Children of the Sea, is just so phenomenal and gorgeous. Um, I'm reading a biography on Susan Sontag. I'm reading a lot of different things at once, and I'm also always sort of reading um, historical documents for research at the same time. And what, what is your sense of uh, the, the space on your bookshelf for revisiting things that you've already read, maybe with a new perspective? I am um, like an obsessive rereader. I reread Alice Munro a lot. Um, I go through and I'll study the sentences and I'll study the structure. So one of the other things I would recommend is, you know, if you read a book once and you were blown away by it, maybe read it again and this time read it looking at the structure or looking at one specific element. And I really think that can help with writing. And in contemporary works, uh, certainly that people um, uh, develop a bias for or become favorites, whether uh, you know they're a series, a collection, maybe there's an author. What about more classic novels uh, going back a uh, hundred years and revisiting the classics? Uh, where do you find time to do that if you do? I do it often. What am I... Um, most major influences is Catherine Ann Porter. Um, and so Pale Horse, Pale Rider is sort of a pivotal work for me. And it's set around um, 1919 in Denver during the height of the influenza pandemic. And that work has been really helpful for me during this time. Yeah, uh, and um, uh, just a, a follow-up question on works, short stories, uh, novels that you may develop, and this idea that more and more, certainly with streaming and other uh, film projects, television projects, uh, what is your aspiration to take some of these stories uh, that you've written or maybe the novel in the making uh, and get them to the big screen? How does a writer feel about that transition? You know, I think for me, my, my goal is to just tell the greatest stories that I can in the written form because I'm in love with language. And mm -hmm. if a great artist or a great director or producer one day were to approach me and say, oh, I want to make this into a movie, um, I would talk to them about it. But my number one goal is to produce great works of literature. And I think I think a cool Netflix series would be great, too. <laughs> well, yeah, we wouldn't say uh, we wouldn't say no to that. So uh, just a, a final word. Uh, Kali, thanks so much for being with us on, on PBS Books. Uh, congratulations on the work. It's uh, certainly nice to uh, visit with you. A final word uh, for our viewers, probably your readers, uh, as we sign off. I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for reading Sabrina and Karina. And for those of you who haven't, I hope you do pick up a copy. And it was so wonderful to talk to you all tonight. So thank you. Kali Fajardo and Steen, all a part of the Library of Congress big event, the National Book Festival, which will be virtually this year, uh, the 25th through the 27th of the, this month in the big two-hour documentary on PBS. Kali, once again, thank you for being with us. Our great thanks from PBS Books. Thank you.